This was the absolute perfect timing to shift over now to our guest for the show, Senator Rand Paul, who is one of the few people in public life who tends to call for restraint when it comes to questions of war. He's probably better known for that than any of his Senate colleagues. Uh, Senator Paul has a new book out on a totally different topic that is also very important and screwed up our world for three years. And a lot of people were deceived over and he was probably the leading senator, probably the leading U.S. politician calling it out and warning about it. Uh, that would be the COVID cover-up. Uh, this is Deception, the great COVID cover-up by Senator Rand Paul. I want to get to COVID and, and what happens next with COVID in just a moment. First, though, I do want to open up with some of these foreign policy questions. Senator Paul, thank you for coming on the show. Good morning, Michael. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Senator, we opened the show today with your colleague, Lindsey Graham, calling for us to bomb Iran. I think because it's a day that ends in Y, uh, Senator Graham decided to call to bomb Iran. Uh, is this likely? Is this advisable? What happens now? You know, I think you do have to ask what happens next if you were to do something. What happens if you drop a bomb on Tehran? Currently, if you look at the public of Iran, the people of Iran, they're very restless towards the uh, regime, restless towards Khomeini. And actually, many of them pro-American. I think the first bomb that drops on Tehran, though, the nationalism of the Iranian people, those that are upset with the Khomeini also become upset with the United States as well for, for an attack. Lindsey Graham said on television, either this morning or yesterday, that even if there is no direct evidence, we should still bomb them. Uh, I think that's rash, unwise, and also discounts what our Constitution uh, calls for. Our Constitution calls for debate. And it calls for the people through their representatives to decide war. I have uh, many friends whose sons and daughters are in the military, 20, 22, 25 years old. And if they're going to be marched off and they're going to put their lives at risk for the rest of us, it's our obligation to have a, a full-throated debate on going to war anywhere for anyone, even our best of allies. We have to have a debate and there has to be a vote in Congress. And believe it or not, people think, oh, Congress is so feckless, we should just let the president do this. Congress will never, you know, get it right. But after 9-11, the vote was nearly unanimous. My father, who's about as anti-war as you can get, voted for the 9-11 authorization for force to go in to get those who attacked us on 9-11. When we were attacked at Pearl Harbor, the vote, once again, nearly unanimous. But we also have to remember that after 9-11, many people said Iraq did it. Everybody's like, Iraq did it. We got to go after Iraq. And I can remember the bombs being unleashed on Iraq. And they had so convinced our soldiers that they were handwriting on the bombs. This is payback for 9-11. And it turns out they had nothing to do with 9-11. Doesn't mean they were a great regime or Saddam Hussein was a Nobel Peace Prize winner, but it meant they had nothing to do. In some ways, we took our eye off of the, the people who did attack us on 9-11. So I think the first thing is first. Uh, the first thing is if there are Americans held hostage and our allies, Israelis, have held hostage, that's the first priority is trying to free the hostages. Um, and I think the second uh, is uh, trying to make sure Hamas can't do this again and that they're uh, incapacitated and that will require a military incapacitation. But that'll be primarily from Israel. You know, they attacked Israel and Israel will respond. And as much as I don't want war, I'm also not one who will be mouthing off saying Israel shouldn't do anything. I'm going to be saying Israel should do what they need to do and only they can know best. But I think those who believe and want to talk about the political situation of Gaza or the West Bank, they lose all credibility. Who's going to listen to you if you're killing women and children? If you're going to a, a, a concert in the desert and mowing down unarmed people, who wants to listen to your argument? So those people, I think, if anything, have unified people in support of Israel for the most part. And those who aren't at this point, you know, the groups at Harvard or the other Middle Eastern countries around there that still blame Israel on this, um, I think they lose all credibility. Before we get to China and COVID, I want to make one last foreign stop up at the other potential source of the Third World War, which is Ukraine. You're one of the few people in Washington who very early on has urged caution in our role in Ukraine. Uh, how does the attack in Israel uh, change the war aims in Ukraine, the situation on the ground, the threat of a, a broader global war? Are we going to keep funding the war in Ukraine? Is there an off-ramp? Or is this just going to go on forever? We have no rainy day fund. We have no surplus. We have no money to give anyone, frankly. We have to mm -hmm. borrow any money we give to foreign countries. We essentially borrow it from China to send it elsewhere. 
but they know there's rising discussion and dissension in the Republican ranks about more and more and more money for Ukraine. So what they're going to do, and what I understand the plan will be, is this week they will link Israel's aid, which will be much more popular, to Ukraine. But then I've also heard they're going to put in money for Taiwan as well. So it's like just Katie bar the door. We're just going to open the floodgates of money the same way Democrats believe in flooding the domestic economy with borrowed money. Now we're going to flood the foreign economies with with uh, printed money. And it isn't rational or, or wise. And what I've asked for each time when you do it, if you think this is in our national interest, which I frankly don't think Ukraine is. But if you think it is, let's offset it. Let's cut spending somewhere else. There's like twenty five billion dollars worth of uh, semiconductor uh, refundable credits. It's basically welfare to billion dollar companies in our country. You know, billion dollar, trillion dollar chip manufacturers are getting taxpayer money. Refundable tax credit is essentially welfare. Uh, there's all the new money for the IRS. There's 44 billion we could take from the IRS. There's 1.7 billion that is going to the Taliban. It's an Afghan reconstruction fund. And they say they're only sending it for humanitarian purposes, but we believe the Taliban is getting their hands on that money. And so in one sense, we'll be saying we're fighting Hamas and radical Islam over here while funding it on the other side. So I'm a stickler for this, even for Israel. I'm supportive of Israel. I've been supportive of the Iron Dome, but I usually ask that it be paid for. People also have to realize emotions run high, but Israel's not short of money. Israel's a very wealthy country. They're the most heavily militarily stocked country in the world, probably other than the U.S. And we give them $3.2 billion a year on an annual basis for the last 30 years. They've got plenty of money and plenty of arms. In addition, last year in December, the Omnibus added an additional billion for Iron Dome. I don't think anybody's saying they're out of weapons. And if they were, I'm perfectly willing to debate it. But I would still ask that we take it from someplace else where we're wasting it. The government is full of waste. But instead of that, if you tell a Democrat this, they will respond and they will say, hmm, we shouldn't have to decide. Everybody should get what they want. We shouldn't have to make these choices. And it's like, that's what legislatures are supposed to do. Make a choice. This is important. This has to be less important. And we set priorities. But that's a real problem we have is we don't do that. We just give everybody everything in Washington. Including China and including that, that lab in Wuhan. Right now, go to BulletproofEveryone.com. Use code Knowles. Bulletproof Everyone is a premier American body armor manufacturer and supplier designed and built for everyday wear. Their unique armor systems offer 25% more coverage than standard armor while maintaining flexibility and all-day wearability. Bulletproof Everyone's ultra-light armor system is so light and thin, you might just forget that you're wearing it. Your safety and discretion is their top concern unless someone puts their hands on you No one will have any clue that you are protected. With Bulletproof Everyone, you are not a walking billboard. There are no visible logos, no flashy designs. Their comfortable tailor-made clothing system goes above and beyond, adding additional security by keeping you incognito and under the radar. Work or play, Bulletproof Everyone has got the perfect armor system to fit your everyday lifestyle and everyday budget. People are worried about rising tensions and rising violence. This is a great way to protect yourself. Right now, our listeners can get 10% off plus a free Bulletproof backpack with the purchase of any Bulletproof clothing. Use code Knowles at checkout, BulletproofEveryone.com. BulletproofEveryone.com, promo code Knowles. I suppose this is uh, the the subject of of your book that's come out. And early on, when, when you called out Fauci and you called out NIH and you raised these questions, you were called a conspiracy theorist. And the rest of us who were not in the U.S. Senate were called conspiracy theorists. And then it would seem that we all turned out to be completely right, and there's been no accountability for it at all. And add on to that, at least before this this outbreak of war in the Middle East, we saw the COVID restrictions creeping up again, implausibly. We hadn't seen this in something like two and a half years. And then again, Lionsgate in Hollywood adds the mask restrictions. Uh, Morris Brown College down in Atlanta, Rutgers University up in uh, Jersey, New York City saying, when you're in public, wear the mask, social distance, like it was deja vu all over again. Are we headed back for more COVID? The amazing thing in the book is that we prove that everything that Fauci lied about is disprovable or proved to be a lie in his own words now. We now have emails revealed from 2020 where he's saying he knew they were doing gain-of-function research in Wuhan, and he knew that the research was dangerous, and he knew that the virus appeared to be manipulated. He said the opposite in public. He called everyone a conspiracy theorist. He said it was a fringe theory. We now have one of his chief lieutenants this uh, Christian Anderson, who uh, 
was all in, saying it came from the lab, saying it was gain of function research. Three days later, he flips and says, oh, no, it, you're crazy if you think that. But in private emails, he's saying it's not a fringe theory. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's the most likely and logical answer is that this virus came from the lab. But it's worse than that. In the book, we reveal that there was a pause on funding for this dangerous research and that it was evaded by one man, by Anthony Fauci, who gave them permission to go around the rules. And then when they set in place a safety committee that said, if you're doing dangerous gain of function, if you're mixing viruses together to make them more infectious or more lethal, that you have to go before this committee. Guess what? The Wuhan research, all the tens of millions of dollars that went to Wuhan, none of it ever went before the safety committee. So we discovered in looking at these emails, one of the emails is from January 31st, 2020, and it's at three in the morning. So Fauci at 10.30 at night gets started, and it's a series of emails that runs through three in the morning. You get this harried sense, you get this sense of fear building, and you get this sense that he can't sleep. And the last email at three in the morning is to the guy that runs the safety committee that's supposed to review this. He's knowing in his mind, or someone has told him, this research never went before the committee. In fact, we have the email where his assistant tells Fauci, you know what? We don't know how this could have happened because it never went before the safety committee. Fauci knows he gave an end to run around the safety committee. So it wasn't just the bad decision to fund gain of function research in a totalitarian country. It was actually the decision then to cover it up because he knew he would have responsibility. So they spent months and months and a year later, face to face in committee, he's denying, he's denying to my face under oath, he's saying, we didn't fund any gain of function. We have never funded any gain of function research in Wuhan. So he lied to Congress, a felony, and he's gotten away with it so far. So the consequences that Fauci has faced, by my last count, are a nice plushy sinecure at Georgetown University. That, that And his retirement from NIH and his millions of dollars from speeches and books over the years and, and uh, other sorts of ways of making he money. Also got a, he also got a million dollars from a foundation. A foundation gave him a million dollars prize for being such a great person. And he took that while being a bureaucrat. But you know what? He's not even gone yet. He says he's not working for the government. He said he retired. But we cannot get the information. They will not reveal. But we do know that he still has a limousine and 24-hour surveillance uh, team that is helping him, a security team. And we think he does go into his office, and we do think that he's still being paid. And our question is, if he's indicted, is the federal government going to be forced to defend him as well, because he's still an employee? So there's a lot going on here that doesn't meet the eye, but we've got nothing but resistance. We send letter after letter to HHS and to NIH, is he still on the payroll? They refuse to answer. We know he's getting the limo because we've gone around them to find the information, but he has a, a limo every day, pick him up to take him to a probably a million dollar job at Georgetown. So it, it's just insane. And the left wing media has continued to cover up for him. Is there any chance, I, I hate to make you put on your prognosticator crystal ball hat now, but is there any chance that he will be held to account or is he just protected by the government? You know, uh, legally, maybe not. You know, I've referred him twice to the Department of Justice. Merrick Garland's not exactly uh, the most objective of uh, prosecutors. Um, and it really is a double standard in our country now. If you're a Republican, you have to be worried about being prosecuted. But he has no fear of being prosecuted. They never will. But as far as accountability, yes. When this started out in 2020, he was like a god on Olympus and nobody touched him. He was Teflon and he was in Vogue magazine and he was modeling and having his portrait painted and gazing at his portrait in his office <laughs> saying, I am science. And if you criticize me, you're criticizing science. All this ridiculous stuff. But you know what? The pendulum has swung quite a bit. He bamboozled most of the scientific community, but a lot of them got mad. When they found out that the letters saying that this was a conspiracy theory, theory were led by Peter Daszak, the guy that was funneling the money, basically the bag man taking the money to Wuhan is the one who organized this and did not reveal his conflict of interest. Even among scientists of different opinions, there's, there's typically agreement that if you're being paid for by a certain organization or corporation, if you're receiving money, you have to reveal that in your journal article. Like if this is done by Pfizer, you jolly well better put Pfizer's name in your paper to say it was funded by Pfizer. And this is a real problem, though, because when I challenged Fauci on the vaccine committees, I said, is anybody on the vaccine committees who's receiving royalties from the manufacturers of, of the vaccine? He wouldn't answer the question and said he didn't have to tell us because the law protected him from having to reveal that. 
that's not really, you know, that comforting that it's not happening when they won't tell us. Right, right. Uh, there's a lot more in the book. Uh, everyone should go get it. Deception, the great COVID cover up by the great Senator Rand Paul. Senator Paul, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Michael. Boy, what a great clip that was. Now, hey, 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 ring that bell. Subscribe to the Michael Knowles YouTube channel. We'll see you next time.